Senator Muskie is, among uh, many other things, the head of a Senate subcommittee on intergovernmental relations. Uh, that committee recently undertook to find out what the people are thinking and what the people's leaders are thinking. Uh, to this end, the committee hired the Lou Harris people to conduct a very extensive investigation, the results of which are stunning and stunningly discouraging. Whereas public confidence in garbage collection is as high as 52%, just under the leader, which is medical care, our confidence in the White House is 18%, the lowest ever recorded. <coughs> Alienation, variously expressed, is at an all-time recorded high. Ignorance is rife to the point of being fashionable. 60% of the people can't give the names of their two senators. 40% are under the impression that there is only a single chamber in Congress. And 20% believe that the Supreme Court is a part of Congress. Whereas, of course, the truth is that Congress is a part of the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> All of this and much more is deeply saddening to Edmund Muskie, who many years ago expressed it as his opinion that successful government requires universal participation and knowledge. That was his view when, as a young lawyer freshly graduated from Cornell Law School and from service in the Navy, he ran for mayor of Waterville, Maine, in 1948, the only time he has ever been defeated. In short order, he was elected governor of Maine and then, in 1958, senator from Maine, the first democratic senator of the century, uh, an augury of the pessimistic findings Senator Muskie's committee has uncovered. <laughs> as we know, Mr. Muskie was selected by Hubert Humphrey as his running mate in the 1968 uh, election and was favored for the presidential nomination in 1972 until things went more or less berserk. <laughs> I should like to begin by asking Senator Muskie, what do you find are the most uh, arresting differences between what the public thinks and what its leaders think? Well, the first uh, finding uh, bearing on that point is that the American people, the ma majority of them, believe that there is something deeply wrong with America, whereas their leaders uh, believe that this is just another crisis that uh, will come and go. Uh, I think also the leaders uh, tend to, uh, tend to uh, entertain <coughs> more confidence in uh, two levels of government, state and local, uh, than uh, the people are. Uh, and so I think throughout uh, the differences between the two, uh, there is this uh, emphasis, uh, matter of emphasis, uh, which uh, prompts the people to believe uh, that some uh, rather significant uh, surgery has to be done upon uh, the body politic, uh, less uh, inclination to on the part of leaders. <coughs> well, now, um I, I see here that uh, your committee reports that, uh, for instance, there is a considerable uh, discrepancy on, on, the f on the, quote, inability of government to solve problems, where you have 61% of the American people, apparently, who believe in the inability of government to solve problems, and, but only 37% of the people's uh, are leaders. Mm -hmm. Since I feel as strongly as I do that the people and not their leaders are correct, on this particular issue. Is there any way that you can account for the discrepancy? Is it an amour propre that makes you feel that you can solve the people's well, problems? Well, I think there's, think there's one explanation for that, and I don't think any explanation ought to satisfy us. I, I, I'd agree with you on that point, but I think one of the explanations is that such a small percentage of the people, as revealed by the poll, you know, have sought access, access to government, either for problem solving or uh, to make uh, their opinions felt. It's a, it's, it's a discouraging low percentage of people who've sought access to government for these purposes. Of those who do seek access, an amazingly high percentage think they've gotten reasonably good results. Uh, but overall, uh, uh, because of this failure to seek uh, access or to experience access, uh, the figure you give is perfectly accurate. Secondly, uh, I think that uh, the leaders at the state and local level tend to measure uh, public reaction to what they're doing on the basis of those who, with whom they do come in contact. And those with whom they do come in contact do respond rather favorably to the results they get. But it is the, it, it is the rest uh, 
who find government irrelevant to the problems of their day-to-day -day lives, who I think are reflected in that 61% figure, and it's a very real one. I think it's one that needs to, uh, to cause us great concern. And how, how would you go about um, commending yourself to, to those people? How, how would you go about um, suggesting to them that they should have more faith in the ability of government to solve their problems? Well, I think it's going to depend upon uh, two characteristics of our system in, in the years ahead. One, the willingness of, uh, of those who are in public office, whether elected or otherwise, uh, to communicate directly and meaningfully with people and uh, to open uh, uh, their own uh, lives uh, and, uh, and uh, activities uh, to public scrutiny. There's another difference between the two leaders and people that I think bear upon this, uh, as disclosed by the poll. Uh, the leaders tend to believe that uh, what we need to deal with our problems is to elect the right people and then leave it to them to make the decisions. Uh, the people think we need to elect the right people, but that even so, they want to see more scrutiny of the behavior and performance uh, of those who hold public office. It's a very real difference. And, and uh, you find it in the reluctance, for example, of committees of the Congress and of state legislatures to open up uh, their uh, executive sessions, uh, their committee uh, meetings uh, to public scrutiny. And yet when they, when, whenever this happens, the public responds very positively. On this question of whether the public is informed, the poll indicates that the people uh, are as harsh as anyone about the, their, about their ignorance. Uh, they, they concede their ignorance. Uh, on, on important matters. And yet at the same time, uh, they indicate a willingness to get involved, uh, provided uh, you know, government uh, measures up to e their expectations. And I'd like to make this other point, Bill, that I think is very important. The, the, the report is very discouraging in its evaluation of public confidence in uh, many institutions, governmental and non-governmental. But it's also very reassuring, I think, in measuring the, the, the belief uh, among our people that this system can be made to work, uh, that the right kind of people can be persuaded to run for office, and that they can be elected. Where, where do you find that uh, in the report? I mean, this just from memory, don't bother. Uh, uh, no, I can find it quickly, because I, I, I think it's so important at a time of universal discouragement uh, to, to, to make this point here, for example, without trying to get into a technical evaluation. Mm -hmm. Here is uh, what the public thinks is possible with respect to getting leaders genuinely working for peace. Ninety percent of them say it's possible. Uh, only 58 percent think we have them. With respect to public officials who really care about the people, 88 percent think it's possible to have them. Only 34 percent think we have them. And uh, that table, I think, is one of the most useful when taken in conjunction with another finding of the report <coughs> that has to do with the characteristics which the people will seek uh, in those who uh, seek public office. And the first one, the one at the top of the list by far, is honesty. Uh, the second one is a clear willingness to work uh, in the public interest. Uh, uh, intelligence and courage come below those, still in the first ten of characteristics. Now you can't contrive, uh, uh, you can't, uh, Candy can't contrive uh, an image of this kind, I don't believe, in, uh, in, in the kind of an electorate we have at the present time. So that over and above the positive things that a candidate might do uh, to sell himself, he's got to, in addition, you know, convey these characteristics, which I think the people will put at the top of their lists. Well, now, <coughs> Can't we, uh, can't we draw certain uh, tentative conclusions on the basis of everything that you've said, which uh, reach into, um, into the uh, essence of democratic optimism? On the one hand, the, the people get the leaders that they desire, and they turn out to be undesirable, i.e. the leaders. Therefore, that leaves the people with uh, uh, a few alternatives to explain that uh, disparity. Either they were fooled, i.e. they thought that Mr. Jones running for senator or governor or president was a, a decent, honest man, and he turned out not to be. Or uh, 
they were uh, 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 lazy in exercising their prerogatives, or in fact, uh, they elected somebody who precisely proceeded to do what that person said he would do, but that this turned out to be uh, ineffective in terms of giving them the kind mm -hmm. of society that they wanted. Now, one of those, uh, one of those conclusions you must have flirted with uh, privately, and I wonder if you would publicly. Well, there's a very interesting uh, uh, table on that too, and I, I, I would accept the first, uh, the first uh, uh, shortcoming that people find. Forty-two percent of them find that uh, the r one of the reasons why the federal government doesn't respond as it should is that uh, politicians make promises they don't keep. Mm -hmm. uh, that's but, and can't keep. Uh, well, the, the question isn't put in that way, but I'd agree with that. Mm -hmm. I think that's. Uh, I think that. That reflects... Uh, Would you be willing to apply your leadership uh, next time the Democratic Party platform is written to keep from it uh, uh, those, those sort of voluptuous promises mm -hmm. that, uh, in fact, you can't fulfill? Well, I've tried that at the state level, and it's pretty hard to control the members of a platform committee, which often includes, I might say, rank-and-file citizens who are now part of this poll, yeah. uh, you know, who write down objectives depends upon how you look at a platform. I think that it ought to be a practical kind of a blueprint for action. A lot of other people think it ought to be nothing, uh, that it ought to be more than that, that it ought to be a, uh, a, uh, an expression of the hopes of our society. And uh, their hopes, uh, of course, will be as broad as their dreams, and that's unrealistic. And so any platform is a mix of the two. And you can never get, I don't believe, Bill, if, uh, I think the only real answer to your question is let's not have platforms. Because I think that <clears throat> without the responsibility for implementing uh, whatever rhetoric you put into a platform, it's, 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 it's difficult to make it as tight as it ought to be in terms of the realities and in terms of not letting people's expectations down. Well, <clears throat> the, the number one issue in your poll that is of public concern, 72%, is inflation. Mm -hmm. Now, what, in your opinion, as you meditate this poll <clears throat> and any delinquency uh, that you or your party uh, might, uh, might be responsible for it, <clears throat> would you wish unsaid at this moment? Do you wish that you hadn't voted for inflationary budgets of the kind that ma make inflation or that you hadn't uh, promised that there wouldn't be inflation? Or to what extent do you feel in any sense uh, guilty for having created this public concern since we do know that it is almost exclusively the role of government to create inflation. It doesn't get created except through the instrumentality of government. Well, first of all, I'm unhappy uh, that President Nixon uh, did not use... Uh, did not impound more of your bills? Uh, no, no, hmm. no. Inflation is, <laughs> is not a product just of budgets. It's a product also of, of economic policy, monetary policy. Uh, the leadership uh, which a president takes. Uh, for example, we gave the president authority uh, with respect to controlling wages and prices. Uh, you, a Congress cannot administer that authority. The president did, and he did it disastrously, in my judgment. Uh, he was reluctant to, uh, to use it at all. He said he, uh, he would uh, veto it uh, if it were given him. For that, he did not do. Well, when he finally used it, it was effective, I think, uh, the uh, initial freeze, and then phase two. Uh, I think they worked reasonably well. At least that was the universal judgment, and I did not challenge it at the <coughs> time. Then he abandoned it in December of 1972, following his landslide election. And the result of that, in my judgment, uh, uh, was to uh, lead almost directly into the second devaluation of the dollar and into the economic consequences of this last year, which. Uh, uh, produced uh, spiraling inflation after a, st a stabilization for a while, uh, plus uh, shortages in commodities as people fled from the dollar toward commodities. Now, uh, when, you know, when the basic uh, economic uh, climate can be so affected by executive action, um, the, the budget uh, ought to, of course, be uh, uh, measured in, in the context of that overall climate, but it isn't uh, the sole factor. 
Now, with respect to... Uh, oh, could we just back up on that? Yes, I'd be yeah. glad to. <laughs> so now, uh, since, uh, since uh, unquestionably among those people uh, who uh, showed up in your poll saying that they had no confidence in government uh, and that they uh, believe that inflation is one of the primary uh, problems, the primary problem here, uh, since most, a lot of those people are, have read a little bit and in the course of their reading uh, have discovered the datum that wage and price controls have never controlled inflation uh, anywhere except for a very, very short period before the distortions uh, occur. I don't think the poll reveals that. Uh, no, I say since we must assume that there are people who answered the poll who have also read economic mm -hmm. history, then wouldn't it follow that hearing you say this right now would fortify their skepticism rather than diminish it? Because after all, it'd be terribly easy not to have inflation at all if it was simply as if it was as simple as simply controlling wages and, and prices. Well, I, d I don't believe that all those who have read on the subject uh, would reach the same conclusion which you have. I happen to have had a brief period of service as a, a price administrator, at the time of the Korean War. Uh, as a result of that experience. Uh, uh, I would be in the front rank of those who would be reluctant to use that kind of authority. But to say that it has no, never has utility uh, in, uh, uh, with the right kind of leadership in imposing uh, a sense of restraint upon those who make uh, wage and price decisions that, uh, uh, that can trigger inflation, I, I think is, uh, an, is an inaccurate reading of history, too. I, well, think, no, I think that the experience yeah. of uh, of uh, the president's use of controls in the, in the first freeze and the subsequent phase two is a demonstration of the fact that if people can generate restraint with respect to these decisions, it is not a pattern for, uh, for the ongoing conduct of, uh, of business in a free society, but at, at, at the time of, uh, of, uh, of the fueling of inflationary pressures of that kind, I, I think it is a useful tool. Well, uh, I, I grant that some people are in favor of wage and price controls, this, this I grant. Mm -hmm. Whether um, there are any left who believe the wage and price controls will hold down the cost of wages and uh, prices uh, in, um, in a um, situation in which you have colossal annual deficits, I, I, I don't know. I do know that there is, in fact, less inflation in America than there is, for instance, in any country in Europe, uh, even countries in Europe that have um, the most rigorous wage and, and, and price uh, uh, controls. Under the circumstances, uh, it seems to me that the kind of restraint that you ought to be talking about is congressional restraint on, on spending. Well, let me say with respect to that, this, is, this last year we cut uh, the president's budget by three billion dollars. Uh, we've cut uh, billions of dollars from each of his budgets the last few years. The budget imbalance of this last year uh, was attributable to inflation and not to uh, uh, not to uh, more dollars spent uh, by but the Congress in the but what caused the inflation? Question. Except presumably a preceding budget. Well, you, uh, your question yeah. rests on the assumption that the only spending that takes place is at the level of the federal government. It takes place at uh, the level of the state government, local government, the private sector, all across the board. We have a trillion dollar economy after all, which represents uh, spending across the board. Uh, so to attribute, uh, you know, inflationary pressures wholly to government spending, as you do, doesn't tell us the whole picture. Well, but uh, an, individual, uh, un uh, an individual does not have the license to overspend uh, that you and Congress do. You occasionally simply go through a formality of lifting well, let's uh, the, let's the, the look limit of your debt by 10 well, or 15, look at billion. The, the I don't have that authority well, myself. Let's look at the principal inflationary pressure of, uh, of today. Yeah. It's not being generated by the government, it's being generated by the cost of energy. In my part of the country, northern New England, this means doubling the cost of heating a home this winter over last winter. That means adding several hundred dollars more of spending in the private sector because of decisions made either in the private sector here or by the oil countries of the Middle East or Venezuela or Canada. Now, this has nothing yeah. to do with the federal budget in this country. No, but it's not and yet it's going to add, uh, it's going <laughs> to add in my state alone, if I remember the figures correctly, several million dollars more of spending that people don't have with the accompanying strains upon the working capital of small businessmen, their ability to survive, 
with an accompanying strain upon the welfare budgets of local state uh, government as well as the federal government. Now, that isn't a budgetary decision that was made by the Congress. Uh, as a matter of fact, Senator, you, you happen to be incorrect <laughs> because um, if somebody spends, uh, uh, assuming that he isn't a millionaire, and we're not talking about millionaires, if somebody spends not in my state. $100, uh, <laughs> uh, well, it's not your fault. <laughs> if somebody spends $100 uh, on gasoline, uh, uh, it is $100 that he is not spending on something else in the typical household, and therefore there's no net inflationary uh, pressure. Uh, with the, the pathos, no, that, that, the pathos that, that, of that the... That is not true, well, Mr. Of course Buckley, it's true. for instance. Well, let me tell you, let me give you a for instance, and I can give you more of them. I mean, one piece of testimony in hearings we held this last week in my state involved a Social Security pensioner whose check is $108 and whose fuel cost now monthly is $100. Now, you can't tell me that she isn't spending something on food even though she had to divert her cash, to, I mean, she's getting something to eat somehow. Now, where that money's coming from, probably, is a strained welfare budget at the, the local level that didn't make provision for this. Well, the welfare budget is put up by the state. That's exactly where I started but this discussion. But it was not budgeted for this purpose. This well, particular. Well, 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 wait a minute. Well, the question the is, where is the pressure generated? Not where is it reflected. Of course, it's going to be reflected in higher welfare costs. Well, then but that, the higher that's welfare what I began costs by saying. were not generated no. at the level of government. They were generated by decisions in the private sector. I assume you would not be urging that we do nothing about feeding that uh, poor lady or others in similar circumstances. If no. you are, then I'm, we I'm, just part I'm, on a matter of philosophy. I'm, but no, on the question it's of uh, easy, yeah. no, I'm, on the I'm, question I'm of what talking, generates the inflation. I'm neither talking you know? about um, the American millionaire, nor am I talking about the lady who is living on $108 a month. I'm talking about the average American. The per capita income in America is $4,200 per year, which is vastly in excess of $108 a month. And the average American family who is going to have to pay $100 more per year uh, for his fuel bill is going to take that $100 that would have been spent on something else and spend it instead on fuel. And therefore, there's no net inflationary mm, pressure. I challenge the inflationary I think you pressure. are going to find, I think you are going to find that the accounts payable, you know, in the hands of, uh, of average working class Americans and the accounts receivable in the hands of small businessmen are going to mount enormously in northern New England because of the cost of energy. Now, it's credit spending, but it is spending. Mm -hmm. And it is spending that they did not plan. Now, I, uh, we, had a, we had an analysis of the, of the conservation of energy in New England uh, since the winter began. Across New England, it's at about 15 percent. In southern New England, it's about 12 to 10 percent. In northern New England, it's 18 percent. The per capita income in northern New England is measurably below that of southern New England, which raises the question. Uh, people in northern New England, you know, saving more because they can't afford to be can't afford to be warm. I mean, s lower income uh, levels are, are, going to are not going to obviate the necessity for spending more in the average household. It just isn't that easy to transfer from uh, spending you, for you food, <laughs> no, spending for food and other necessities. We're talking about essentials. I know, that's Spending right for food to energy. You, it, isn't, you, it isn't that easy. You, you're implying, uh, you're, you're implying uh, and you get your concepts all mixed up. Uh, sometimes you're to talking about the lady who has only $108 a month. Uh, other times you're talking about uh, a, a family that is simply going to come up with that extra $100 for the fuel. Uh, I say that uh, the resources of the typical family tend not to be that, uh, unfortunately, that, uh, that ample. And under the circumstances, there won't be an inflationary policy. But anyway, if there is... No, what you're saying, now you're mixed up, Bill. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is, you know, that nobody's going to have to dip into savings, or, or ask for more credit, or turn to welfare, or other forms of relief to meet the higher cost of energy. You're yeah. saying that it's going to be a simple matter no, of tra tra <laughs> transferring, uh, transferring the paycheck from food to energy, or from clothes to energy, or from school to energy. It isn't going to be that simple. Well, in the first place, I didn't say nobody, because I wouldn't say nobody about anybody, Nelson Rockefeller or your lady with $108. I'm talking about the generality. Now, if you were so concerned about uh, remitting to the people 
the amount of extra money they're having to spend, why don't you lower your taxes on gasoline? If uh, the taxes on gas are eight times as high as the profits on the sale of gas. So if you're so weepy about it, lower your taxes. My being weepy but had nothing to do <laughs> with oh, the yes, question. Oh, yes, getting very no, weepy no, no. there a moment ago <laughs> about, about no, that no. lady. No, no, let's about get back to the question lady. which you asked. Yeah. I'm saying you said the government that this is primarily inflation, responsible and for I inflation. say that it is not in these present circumstances the government. There have been no appropriations bills enacted since November. These inflationary pressures have developed since and they've developed out of the cost of energy, and I suggest... And I'm saying they're not inflationary pressures. They are inflationary and, and in pressures. And in any case, Senator, we're talking about 2.75% of the average family budget, which is what they spend on fuel. But we had a much, much uh, bigger example what, what, of this. What year are you using this Last basis? year. Well, it's, it's, Sorry it's about a that. much uh, different picture no, today. No, that's right. It's like, exactly. likely to go to 325 uh, but we're still not talking about, for instance, take food. We're not talking about my for, part for of the country. Food is five and five times. We're not talking about my part of the country. Well, we don't have to talk about your part of the country, do we? Well, I, mean, I Maine do. Is, Maine is a lot colder. There's than some Maine places. constituents watching here, and I want them to know that I'm concerned about their problem. Yeah, but you and I think there are some people you, in your state of New York. You are the head of a great big committee. Especially northern New York that are also concerned. But you head of the great, great, great big committee, uh, and you commissioned a poll based not on the concerns of the people of Maine exclusively, but about people with the concerns of Ohio and, and Florida, even well, in California. In this poll, no. even in September, before the energy crisis, 10% of the people were concerned about the rising cost of energy. And this wasn't I'm just Maine. I'm concerned about it. Who's, who says we shouldn't be concerned about it? I'm simply saying that uh, one of the reasons why a lot of people don't have the faith they ought to have in their leaders is because they still find them at this day and age are saying that the government isn't the primary cause of inflation. But of course government is the primary cause of inflation. Inflation is that which happens when there is an excess of demand and, and insufficient supply. Now granted, the supply has diminished as a result of uh, Persian Gulf politics, but it is only costing us 15% uh, total. Now, the people in West Germany or Italy have something to worry about, but not by contrast with us. If our most pessimistic predictions come true, we will still have as much fuel and gas as we had in 1970. And that wasn't a year of a huge potato famine shortage. So that um, uh, I think if we keep our eye on the ball, it ought to be on things like $100 billion of deficit in the last four, five, six years. But this has happened in the Democratic Congress. Democratic Senate, you were one of the leaders, not only in the Senate, but of the whole country. But you, you don't strike me as penitent enough, considering what you have accomplished. Uh, well, in the uh, way of in making people as unhappy as you just proved they are. I'm not penitent by your standards, uh, Bill, because uh, I don't accept your premises. Debt in the private sector, over any period you want to talk about, has escalated faster than government debt. The statistics going back a quarter of a century demonstrate that. And yet somehow debt... But that's funded debt. I mean, this is... <laughs> The, well, uh, the, 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 the this li makes a difference? Uh, well, the, limit, the limit that a bank can lend is, uh, is, is set, as we know, by the banking system. No, I'm not system. talking just about bank lending. I'm talking about... How else can you spend if you don't go into debt? Uh, corporate debt is up. But, how, but they corporate got to borrow debt? it? Yes, of course they borrow. If, they if borrow the corporation spends a lot of money, they borrow they and Have you ever heard of bond issues, bond. Bill? Sure. All right. Bond issues are not necessarily funded by banks, but by the people, just as, I know, but just as government th budgets are funded by the people through but their that's taxes. money that goes out of circulation when you buy the bond. If I buy a $1,000 bond, I don't have $1,000 left to spend. But when you people spend, you simply vote yourself an increase in the statutory limit of your debt, and you find yourself uh, $35 billion overspent. Now, that's why people are terribly unhappy. And uh, you've, you've established that you they're Have you been reading the same poll that I've been reading? I've been reading your report. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. The poll doesn't indicate any such thing. And well, as a matter of fact, the poll of, of the American people are, uh, list economy and inflation as the principal issue of concern. And economy inflation to you economy is budget, but they did, uh, federal budgets, they didn't say that. Well, hell, they don't even know the names of their two senators. <laughs> <laughs> so why, why should they be economists and, 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 well, and have why, a minute well, knowledge of... Why uh, do you quote uh, them with such solid uh, conviction? Because I can, look, I can look in you, the you encyclopedia. Like, you like to cite them with respect to that part of what they say that you like. <laughs> but when I, when I remind you of something they say you don't like, then you challenge no, the validity no. of the poll. <laughs> I didn't, I'm not you can't to have it. it both ways. You I'm not talk about it. me being mixed yeah. up. <laughs> you know? well, look, if, uh, if, uh, if, if somebody says, uh, I am primarily afraid of venereal disease, <laughs> uh, I, I can acknowledge I'm that that person... I'm not an person, expert on that. I can, no, no. <clears throat> I can acknowledge... 
I can acknowledge that they have a fear of venereal disease and know what it is, but it doesn't require that they should know what it is. I don't think that people necessarily know what it is that creates inflation. Otherwise, there would probably be far fewer Democrats elected. All right, then but let's it, put that <laughs> aside. Then the debate relates not to what the, the people are saying, but to how you and I interpret what they're saying. But don't you understand, we, 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 I, I tried very carefully to frame the question so that we would be getting somewhere. We started off by the fact that the well, American people... Well, I can't people, help it if you succeeded in going nowhere. <laughs> no, no, yeah. no I, I, I succeeded in, in going in the direction of uh, pointing out a paradox which you are visibly uncomfortable with. One is that the American people aren't getting from their leaders what they want. Uh, and secondly, what they fear most uh, is e the economy dash inflation. Let me make a point here. And I'm saying that you've given them no, this inflation that they're worried about. Yeah. Therefore, they're being consistent. No, but let me make a point. You know, you talk about their leaders as though what they were unhappy about were only those of us in government. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of the other people they're unhappy about. They're unhappy about you people on television media. Forty only, Not I as mean, much. For only 41% have uh, uh, expressed uh, confidence. Well, in, we're doing twice as well as you all. <laughs> no, no, we're not. No, we're not. It's 31% in the Senate, and it's 30% in the well, House, you, you, and the writing press is 29%. So let's, uh, you know, let, let's uh, assume a little of this responsibility in our respective spheres. I mean, you can be as misleading as we can be, and the I've people never, are saying that you are. I've never tried it being misleading, see? but... Uh, uh, well, I, I haven't I, deliberately tried either, I assure you. <laughs> <laughs> Just accidentally. The, well, the, uh, the, uh, uh, it, it, no, it's quite true that there is uh, only 41% of the people uh, uh, have faith in television news, and I think they're right. I think that tel television uh, news is very... I think uh, if I could uh, put an aside here, that's the one institution that has gone up in public confidence since 66, mm -hmm. which is an interesting commentary from... I mean, forgetting our personal involvement. Not necessarily. Uh, from 26 to, to 41 no. since 66. But, no, but the point is, if you're, if you're a successful brainwasher, one of the things that you do is increase people's confidence in you. Well, what you're saying <laughs> is that if people are confident in you, then you've brainwashed them. We, it could be. It could be. Well, I mean, the... the, the, well, that, the that leads us right around well, a nice big fast the most, circle. The, mo <laughs> the, the most popular class of people uh, in Africa are witch doctors. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's an established fact. Uh, but you and I don't believe in witch doctors, do we? Well, I'm not altogether sure that we shouldn't <laughs> at this well, point. I'm, yeah, I'm not all, altogether sure that they wouldn't do better than the leaders that we're so dissatisfied with. But the, the point of the matter is that uh, it is a little bit circular. Sometimes you do succeed in exalting your reputation by the skill with which you seduce people into That's believing true. that which isn't true. And yet I think that, that the tendency to do that uh, and succeed hopefully will be... Uh, well, the tendency may continue, but the success, I think, will be diminished in the light of this present uh, uh, skepticism uh, on the part of the public. I really believe that. Yes, but don't, don't you agree, uh, Senator, that since, uh, since if one looks in the, any encyclopedia under inflation and finds there a definition of it, uh, which I have with exquisite uh, uh, accuracy reproduced, uh, that, uh, that, that people's uh, uh, skepticism increases when they hear you reach rather desperately for other causes of inflation so as to relieve yourself of your share of the responsibility for it. Well, I, I, t I tell you what arouses my skepticism is when you can with such authority say you can open any encyclopedia and find my version of economic theory well, that clearly, clearly exposed, you know, I'm skeptical <laughs> about your reading habits. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think only, there are only two or three encyclopedias and, and I, I don't think that... Uh, they're, they're worth they're, reading. They're, they're, there are lots of... There are lots of uh, there are lots of prescriptions for inflation, but not that I know of are there um, disagreements as to what the word inflation defines. Well, I don't, and, I don't uh, disagree with you about that. Uh, there's money for inflation and price inflation and yeah. cost of push inflation yes. and all that kind of stuff. Well, anyway, uh, would you say that the alienation uh, that your study uh, reveals uh, is in part as a result of the collapse of the redemptive... Um, features of American liberalism, the fact well, that I it is... I think it might be uh, useful, you know, to get the, the actual uh, uh, words in which uh, alienation is described, because yeah. uh, I think it's the best answer to your question. There are four tests of alienation that are, you know, traditionally used by the pollsters, and this poll adds three more. And I think it would be interesting... Uh, to read them, uh, read them all. I don't think it ha has anything to do with liberalism or conservatism. 
The first, do you agree with these statements? And these are the statements. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Well, 76%. Yes, that, that, <coughs> that is the trend in alienation. Yeah, and the 55 percent you're yeah. talking about. And of course it isn't true. Is, is a, well, let me read the rest of them. What you read things you think, irrespective of whether they're true or not, things that are believed. No, you, you said, uh, Bill, if I may get you back on track, mm -hmm. that this poll reveals that the people are more alienated than ever before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true, 55% mm -hmm. of them. Yeah. What I'm giving you is the makeup of that 55%. Now, if you accept the 55, you ought not to object to the analysis. Oh, I do very much. All right, well, then this is the analysis. Because um, uh, you know, if, if you said uh, uh, grass grows red, this poll uh, doesn't say that. I know, <laughs> but, so no, but it, it, says something, it says something very close to that when it says the rich grow richer and the poor grow poorer. No, no, these, you, you approved, uh, or you accepted at least, the finding that on an average of 55% on a four-question scale expressed disenchantment compared with no more than 29% who felt the same way back in 1966. What I'm reading to you is the four-question scale. Disenchantment and alienation are, are simply not related. If well, you want to talk about disenchantment, go ahead. But uh, that wasn't what I was referring to. This 55 percent is the alienation question, the crisis of confidence, trend in alienation and powerlessness felt by the American people. Any encyclopedia this is exactly you the alienation point, does not mean that. This is the, precisely the point that you were throwing at me and asking me if that reflected, you know, a disillusion with liberal thought. What I'm trying to do in response to that question, which you put, I didn't yeah. frame it, yeah. was, the, was the actual Analysis. Okay. You, you're going to tell now me what they the think. What, what, what? No, I'm going to tell you Go what ahead. the pollster <clears throat> used to measure alienation. No, they didn't measure alienation. Yes, the pollster. To measure pollster, These are the questions okay, that the yeah. pollster put. I mean, you've read this thing. Yeah. And you know and that, this, sport, that yeah. what I'm saying is true. Mm -hmm. That these are the questions that the pollsters traditionally put yeah. to measure alienation. Mm -hmm. The first question was do you agree with the statement the rich get richer and the poor get poorer? Second, what you think doesn't count anymore. Third, people running the country don't really care what happens to you. Fourth, you feel left out of things going on around you. And then there are these other three new questions that were thrown in. Do you agree with the proposition, do agree or disagree with the proposition that most people with power try to take advantage of people like you? The next one was, the tax laws are written to help the rich not the average man. And finally, wiretapping and spying under the excuse of national security is a serious threat to people's privacy. Now, it's because a majority of the people, you know, believe those statements now, or statements like that, that 55% of them are alienated. <coughs> now, I didn't write that. That isn't a political tract that I put <coughs> together. Senator no, Roski, please, we, we've got to be a little bit more precise. The, the majority of the American people can believe, as you and I do, that um, there oughtn't to be wiretapping, that it's an invasion of privacy. Mm -hmm. But it, it requires you to say, what's more, we believe there is wiretapping before you have a vote for disenchantment, right? They responded to these questions. I didn't put the questions to them. Yeah. These questions you do and follow. their reaction to <clears throat> it are reflected in the poll. Now, it's your, you're right, of course, Bill to challenge the validity of the poll. That question hasn't arisen here. What we're talking about is what the poll says. Yeah. And I've tried to, I've tried to fill in uh, uh, some, uh, some definition of what the poll says from its own language. Look. Now, whether the question should have been put differently, you know, is a legitimate there's question. There's a complete lack of intellectual rigor in what you've just been saying. But I didn't it's say one, it's it. One the pollster no, all right, said it. All right, all right, let's say the poll. Let's not blame you, the poll. If you ask everybody in this room, do you believe that your phones should be bugged? And 95% of them say, no, I don't think our phones should be bugged. I am not entitled to conclude that the majority of the people in this room feel alienated unless they say, what's more, our phones are being bugged. Now, you never said anywhere that people feel that their phones are being bugged. In point of fact, there are half as many bugs out now as there were in the heyday of the Kennedy administration when people didn't feel alienated. This, this in point of fact, the rich aren't getting rich, rich, richer and the poor poorer. They're both getting mm -hmm. richer. So that uh, if, you, if you say, here is a list of superstitions that are afflicting a number of Americans, that's fine. But I was asking about the causes of alienation. And b both you and I agree that there is alienation, isn't it? Well, it seems to me that 
since you and I are accepting the Poles' measure of whether or not there is alienation, that we ought to be interested in how the Pole arrived at that conclusion. That's a technical question. It, it is mm. not technical. The, the, it's very the, substantive. The fact of the matter Independent is. of this Pole, I have no <clears throat> personal antennae that tell me Don't you? what percentage, what percentage. Oh, well. Oh, oh well. I mean, uh, <clears throat> you know, if you brush aside uh, the facts that are inconsistent with what you have in mind, uh, you know, there's no basis for discussion. I have no antennae that give me a percentage of alienation. I'm not my impression <clears throat> after coming back from my state, following a two-week two tour, is that there is almost a complete collapse of public confidence, uh, well, I'm, especially I'm in, in the White House. But I wouldn't seek to attach a percentage to it, but this uh, poll undertakes to, to do so. Senator, I don't have a favorite statistic that I'm trying to force feed you with. Uh, I'm simply saying that I'm not uh, suggesting that you stu do. the students of alienation uh, begin with much more fundamental questions than how many wiretaps are out. They begin with such questions as, what is life all about? To what extent have we identified uh, our idealism with uh, political accomplishments? And to what extent has politics failed? Well, could I ask you a question? Sure. You know, if, if what you're interested in, you know, is, is this poll and analyzing it and discussing it, I'm perfectly willing to you know, to discuss that. But if when I try to answer a question, you know, that you draw from that poll, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, 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 want, you, you prefer to go off into another philosophical discussion or a question about the validity of the poll, then I find it difficult to conduct the discussion. Uh, I undertook to explain, you know, what the poll meant by alienation and what it was based upon. Now, if that's irrelevant well, why didn't you to, say it to is what you're interested silly in, poll. Because I don't think it is a silly poll. Well, let's talk about whether it's a silly poll. I say it's very silly to, to say that people are alienated because they believe one or two of those, those things. Now, the central questions that you uh, are Well, let read, me say something in response to that. Sure. The, those four questions are questions that pollsters have used <clears throat> to test this same question you know, for the last 20 years. You said you added three. Uh, uh, I said there were four, the other three were you just added. added. Yeah. But the first four, and you called them all silly, no, no, so I, I assume no, no, they're no. all silly in your view. The first no, four have been silly. traditional tests. No, they're not all silly. And I don't, think the, I don't think that your inquiry is at all silly. I think it's highly worthwhile. But I do think that, the, that, that they're highly arbitrary questions that were uh, brought in in an attempt to define uh, alienation. Well, I think that it would be very helpful, uh, you know, to get your suggestions as to what the questions might be. I can say I'm making you, them right now. I sure. can say to you that uh, uh, several weeks of effort went into the drafting of the questions uh, with the assistance of Mr. Harris and with the assistance of others in the position to, uh, to have some judgment on it. And they could be wrong. I think it's the most extensive questionnaire that may ever have been put uh, to uh, a survey sample. It took an hour and a half to ask to, to go through the questions with each subject, uh, with each uh, citizen who was questioned. So I think but it was a very, very thoughtfully put together poll. I could challenge particular questions. But if what you're trying to get, and that's what I get out, try to get out of a poll, if what you're trying to get is a feel for what it is uh, that, that people think about when they think about government, about their attitudes, if you're not trying to nail them to the cross on on their reaction, just trying to get a feel for the country. Mm -hmm. And I think <clears> that's what we're all trying to get. Then it seems to me that, you know, these, these questions have, and the reaction to them have some relevance. You're not going to hang anybody on the basis of any of these percentages. You're not going to send anybody to jail. You're trying to get a feel for what disturbs people. And I find this, this, this survey a remarkable reflection of the attitudes of people uh, I meet as I travel in my own state and elsewhere. And so I, do, I think we ought to avoid nitpicking well, I, about it. I think we ought to, you know, it, to it try like to get the it's thrust of what they're saying. It's hardly nitpicking to ask whether the central questions have been considered. After all, uh, here we are 30 years after Keynes has died, and our economy is, by everybody's uh, uh, understanding, being mismanaged. Why? There's, there's nothing in that thing that will show you why. Uh, here we are uh, 30 years after, uh, 100 years after the flowering of democratic uh, optimism in the 19th century, and people have no faith in their leaders. Uh, here we are after having recognized uh, the hideousness of, uh, of war, uh, living in a century that has had more war than any other century in the history of the world. Now, I say these are very central, important questions, 
and Lou Harris is dangling uh, uh, in front of uh, a lot of people, 40% of whom don't even know that there are two chambers of Congress, uh, is, is worth a limited amount of attention, not the whole of our attention. What we need primarily to ask ourselves is, why are people feeling so dissatisfied? And that's why I seek to ask some rude questions. I have no objection to that. Uh, we have some <coughs> guests here, Mr. Uh, Kuttner. I have a question for Mr. Buckley. As I understood your economics before in the discussion of the lady in Maine with a $108 yeah. Social yeah. Security check, you seem to be saying that if the cost of one essential heating oil mm -hmm. went up and she had less purchasing power for other things, that that somehow wasn't inflationary because she had the same amount of money to spend. And yet if your purchasing power as a whole goes down because you have to spend more money on one commodity, I've always thought that that was a classic definition of inflation. No, you're wrong. It isn't. Thank you. Right. <laughs> uh, deflation, not inflation. Deflation, when uh, the price of something goes up and your purchasing power drops, that's deflation. Sure, if there, if there is less demand and an abundance of supply, that's deflationary, not inflationary. But there's not an abundance of supply. There's a shortage, and that's why prices have gone up, and that's why the lady... But in the example which you gave, there was, de there, there was a, 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 an absence of an IE, that much which the lady otherwise was prepared to, to spend on, say, coats is not spent on coats. It is, in fact, spent on something else. Uh, so therefore, we have, uh, we have neither an inflationary net nor a deflationary net situation. If it is withdrawn from the purchase of coats in anticipation of having to pay more than, in fact, she pays for oil, then it is deflationary. I think in fact, they, they worried about this. Uh, there was, you know, for every penny of tax that is added, or every penny of cost that is added to gasoline, it's a billion dollars. That billion dollars withdrawn from the economy could result uh, in a, a certain stagnation, which would be deflationary. In fact, that's why some of the people in Washington have been opposed to the idea of an excess. Then, then by your time. theory, every time prices go up, effective purchasing power drops, and every time you have inflation, no, no, you no, have no, deflation. No, 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 it, no. it, it depends. Uh, it depends on whether there is a transitional stage in the withdrawing of the dollar. Uh, as devoted to the purchase of one thing and prospectively the purchase of something else. I see. If, if I say to myself, uh, I believe I'm going to have to spend $1,000 more this year on fuel, under the circumstances I'm going to withhold $1,000 from uh, this that I was otherwise going to buy, that would be deflationary until I proceed to spend it on fuel. Senator Muskie, do you think that the Watergate fallout, the lack of confidence that may or may not be reflected in this poll, is going to affect all incumbents equally, as the Republicans seem to be hoping? It's going to affect all incumbents. Uh, I would think that uh, I, I don't have a count on party. I would think that probably the Republicans have a heavier, bear to bur uh, heavier burden to bear. Uh, that may or may not uh, that may or may not be changed between now and November. But I, I don't think anyone ought to jump to the conclusion that this is a Republican or a Democratic uh, problem uh, per se. And incidentally, this poll is not just a reflection of Watergate. It, it goes back uh, many, many years, at least a decade. I would say. The, the poll is very anti-Nixon, certainly, in effect, it seems to me. I, I don't mean that. Watergate isn't general. mentioned in the poll. No, I say polls in general, very anti-Nixon effect. Oh, yes. But, but also uh, there was a poll that yeah. said that Ford could beat either Scoop Jackson or Teddy Kennedy, which suggests that people's um, values have not been uh, affected by Watergate. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's debatable, yeah. but we won't take the time. <laughs> Uh, first question for you, Mr. Buckley. I'm puzzled at your extreme concern over this poll. It seems to me that a conservative might look on this with uh, great satisfaction as it would show the buildup of a uh, ingrained skepticism, uh, the reduction of expectations, right. and so forth. Quite right. I was, I was not surprised in the least. I'm disappointed because I would like to be proved wrong, but in fact, it simply <laughs> justifies what I've been saying for years. <laughs> But the actual, the actual dissatisfaction with government, the actual skepticism mm -hmm. in itself. I think it's very healthy. You think it is very healthy? Yeah. You think it's something, do you think it's healthy because of the state the government is in right now, or do you think it's something which should be cultivated generally? Well, I, think for, I think that's for metaphysical reasons. I think that the, the rhetoric of the New Deal uh, 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 encouraged people to believe that government could give them happy lives. Yes. I don't think government can. So and, in other words, to, to the extent that they realize this, they expect less from government, and they're better off. As yeah. Peter Drucker has said, the government can only do two things successfully. One is inflate the currency, and the other is wage war. At this point, we're not even sure they can wage war very successfully, but they certainly can inflate the currency. Could I respond to that question? Yes, too? sir. Yeah. You know, 
I, I agree with Bill that the you know, skepticism about the government, especially in, in the context of its present performance, can be a very healthy thing. But I don't think it altogether arises from the fact that people have decided government shouldn't you know, have certain responsibilities. As a matter of fact, 89% of the public agree that the federal government, the federal government has a deep responsibility for seeing to it that the poor are taken care of, that no one goes hungry, and that every person achieves a minimum standard of living. Now, whatever uh, you know, your political predisposition, that's a, a reaction. At the same time, the same people believe that the federal government should turn a lot of its responsibilities over state and local uh, government. So uh, when you say that the federal government has a responsibility, that doesn't mean necessarily that they want to see more programs, or that they think the programs have been good, or that they necessarily have any fixed notion of how the problem ought to be attacked. What they're looking for is strong leadership. And I think strong in the context of this poll probably means uh, strong in terms of strong character, uh, inspirational leadership, uh, a sense of setting direction, and so on. My goodness, you really think that I would have thought the opposite in a way, that yeah, the guy who came be. along with uh, you know, inspirational leadership would be totally mistrusted right now. That's the time to count uh, your uh, uh, make, uh, <laughs> you're, you're confusing inspirational with charismatic. Oh, well, they're awfully close. I don't, no, no not to me. <laughs> does the Harris Poll say which is the correct one? So, I, mean, <laughs> I, mean, I, I can think of very inspirational leaders who wouldn't be called charismatic by the, the, today's TV terms. Well, let's not get into that because no, I no, think that, we get, it'll, that's a swamp. But along the lines of my first question, it seems to me that there are two elements being mixed up in this uh, concept of disenchantment. One is that people think that politicians are crooked, i.e. tapping their phones or doing something like that. The other is, and this, is, uh, this would apply to the economy, that they're incompetent or that they can't cope or that no human being can cope. Uh, those are two very different. Uh, yeah, they're both part of the mix, according to the poll. They're both part of the mix. You just, you don't think that it would be worthwhile to try to separate those two well, uh, I would say it's to, unhealthy for, to have people think that their politicians are crooked, that it's not necessarily unhealthy at all for them to have, be extremely skeptical about what they can actually well, do. Well, they definitely raise questions about the honesty of politicians. Now, whether that means, uh, you know, honesty, money honest, or intellect, uh, intellectual honest, or what, is, uh, I don't know that that's... Uh, primarily that the latter, I should yeah, think. I think pr primarily <clears throat> the yeah. latter. I don't think they talk about money honest. It's... Uh, uh, it's the, making, a, making promises that you don't keep, which I think is what bothers them most. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, I, I think Bill might agree with uh, and, and please, may I say this, you know, uh, Bill and I have discussed this with our very uh, different perspectives, but uh, we may not have been fair to the report, e either of us. Uh, it might be worth your reading. You, you know. Can they get it from your committee? I think there are a certain number, uh, and you can certainly get it. Uh, uh, well, I don't know what... Uh, I'd, I'd be glad to try to get you one if you want. Mr. Okay. Arnick? If there is such a hostility now to uh, politicians, does this mean that uh, 76 might be the year of, of the non-politician? Uh, should new figures be tested in the polls? For example, should uh, Lou Harris in his next presidential poll test uh, John Gardner or Ralph Nader or along Nader. with the uh, conventional names? Uh, do you think the public is looking for non-politicians to provide whether it's uh, inspirational or charismatic leadership? Yeah. I think so. I think the new, uh, the new uh, th this is a, a period that could uh, you know, produce a lot of new leaders, and the public may be more likely to respond to new faces. Well, the polls are an effective way at this point, before they've had exposure, you know, to evaluate their potential. I, I, I have some doubt. I, having had considerable experience with polls myself, you know, I have doubts as to the utility, and I certainly wouldn't lean on them as I would on a crutch. Uh, they, they are valuable. That includes the Harris Poll? Yes, all of them, on, 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 on political figures at least. I think they're better on this sort of thing than they are. But even there, you've got to know what the questions are. I mean, the response depends so much on the question. That's why I think it's useful to have both Gallup and Harris, and occasionally another one, giving us readings like this. They ask different kinds of questions, and you can check them out against each other. But on political figures, potential presidents or senators or governors or what have you, 
the pole really isn't very helpful but except until the through people poles, that you measure are, have had some exposure. But Mr. Arnick is complaining that they haven't tried out these non-political types oh, I agree. in preference polls, is that right? That's <coughs> right. You have uh, one list which is called the 10 most admired Americans, for example, in which a variety of figures are listed, some politicians, some not. I think my uh, impression to what is that that one uh, is a pure spontaneous response from the public. That's right, but how many of those names are ever transferred? How many leaders in other fields, whether it's you business or how, labor? Who would you vote for, Billy Graham or uh, Teddy Kennedy yeah. kind of thing? No, that's well, never I think you have to, if you're going to say that we need new political figures, then presumably we have to take some people who are leaders in other areas of endeavor, including the media. I would see Mr. Buckley running against Mr. Vidal, a great campaign, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> you know, the world would love. But you have to take new personalities, new figures who have shown their leadership in other fields and compare them to the old leaders in the political sphere. Otherwise, you have no way of broadening the number of choices that the electorate has. And I think there has well, been a failure to I'd do I certainly that. have no objection to that at all. <laughs> it doesn't involve me personally. Well, you mean you don't, you don't think that um, a background in, uh, in public affairs uh, is, is uh, a necessary qualification for leadership? You, you don't, you don't oh, mean no, to restrict no, no. it to presidents, or do you? No, it would be in all offices. Or senators or anything like that. Oh no! I, I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I, I think you do, uh, that a, a, you know, a professionalism or background experience in politics is as important in, as in any other field. That doesn't, uh, uh, that doesn't, and shouldn't restrain anyone new from coming in. Uh, President Eisenhower is the foremost example of one who did, and succeeded at least in winning elections. And I have no objection to that, uh, but with respect to and the question that was put to me, he, uh, the question simply was, well, what do I think about? pollsters uh, running other people than politicians, you know, in, in these trial heats. I have no feeling about it one way or another. I wouldn't think it would be particularly useful politically unless the people who were being measured had some political ambition. Thank you very much, Senator Muskie. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the panel. Thank you all. Next week on Firing Line, Mr. Buckley exchanges ideas on tax reform with Professor Stanley Surrey. For a printed bound copy of this program, send 25 cents in coin to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29250. That's 25 cents to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29250. This program was made possible by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.